Today we're going to be finishing chapter two. We're also going to be going through the economic systems exercise. But you may see on the screen that it says that these items are due on Monday. I'm giving you a present. I'm extending the due dates. So we're going to move those due dates back to Wednesday. Next week I'll be updating that on Canvas uh, probably later today. This is one of those days, guys, where everything in the world seems to be going on. I'm out of breath because I've been running since the moment I got here and I need to do more cardio, but that's all my issue. Guys, before we get in for today, and I, I have a check-in sheet, so don't worry about that. I just want to see by show of hands, how many of you went to the speaker on Wednesday night? Any feedback? Any, any impact that she made? What did you think? What, did, what, what are your opinions of the speaker? Yes? Oh, yeah, that, the guy who was sitting in the back. And the very fact that she's like, yeah, you know, my daughter's single. She's looking for, for somebody. I mean, he, he was, like, on the spot. Yeah. Um, I like when she um, was talking about Pat, uh, you know, like you could um, meet Pat more often. Um, like, she kept talking about swiping his credit card. And if you, like, actually laid out that cat, uh, then you did you become more tangible. I don't know. I, just, I, I like it. Does anybody agree with that, by the way, that you tend to spend less when you have cash? I, I'm the same way. If I take money out of the bank and I literally have to watch it coming out of my wallet, I do spend less. I'm not Now, I'm one of those guys, too. I, I hardly ever have cash. Who's guilty of that? I never have cash in my wallet, but when I do, I spend it more carefully. Any other reactions to, to Michelle? Yes? She was pretty funny. Oh, she, uh, we were dying back there. It was funny because all of us old folks were sitting in the back, and I think we were laughing harder than anybody. She was When she was doing the walk through the crowd, doing the Jennifer Hudson thing about, you know, I, I love budgeting. I mean, she was amazing. I, I'd go see her speak anytime. I really enjoyed her. Anybody else have any comments about, about Michelle? Guys, that's a pretty, oh, I'm sorry, man. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say that. I, I think it's awesome, too. And here's the trick. When we start thinking about wealthy people, when we think about the, the wealthiest people in the world, who sticks out to us? We think of celebrities. Who else? Bill Gates. Well, sure, Bill Gates. And he, he's got more money than he knows what to do with. We also think of professional athletes. Guys, here's a sobering statistic. When you get an NFL player, after the average NFL player retires, do you know most of these guys are bankrupt in five years? Why is that? Sorry? Yeah, it's like if you come from a place where maybe you didn't have money, all of a sudden you have money, you're not using it in smart ways. And the other thing, too, when you become rich out of nowhere, all these people who you never knew start to come out of the woodwork and seem to appear and want to get some of your money as well. Any other feedback, guys, on the event? I really enjoyed it. To me, it felt like a great evening, and I, I really enjoyed being there with all of you. So we're going to be covering uh, the economic systems uh, exercise in class today. And I am going to be extending the due dates on those. Guys, I want to give you a, a couple of updates. You're going to have four opportunities next week for CES. If you need CES, we're going to be doing a whole week of superhero activities. I am taking a minute out of class to plug this. It's something I'm very passionate about. It's going to be a great week. Uh, on Monday at 7.15, many of you who are new to the community uh, may not realize we experienced a couple of losses over this year. Several students who passed away, two unfortunately uh, through suicide, one uh, victim of gun violence. And so we have a speaker coming in from a local group called The Healing Patch. And she's going to talk about how we can support ourselves and loved ones during times of loss. This ties in with the event very much. Who can tell me why Bruce Wayne becomes back? What is the event? Yes. His parents were killed. Yeah, as a, as a young child, he sees his parents uh, killed before his eyes and makes this solemn vow to never see another <coughs> child suffer the way he has suffered. So this fits in well. Uh, my, my connection with the Healing Patch, I volunteer and fundraise for this organization as well. They provide services to any child who, who's experienced a loss for free. And so Melody Ray, a dear friend of mine, is coming in. It's going to be a great session. CES is, is there for that one. The second one in JFK on Tuesday night, this one's really cool. We're bringing in the physical therapy department to talk about 
what it would really take to be an honest-to-goodness superhero. Now, we're not talking about flying or shooting laser beams out of your eyes. But if you wanted to be Batman, like the way we see Batman in the Dark Knight movies, what would you have to do to achieve that level of physicality to be able to do it? Could you actually be Batman? That's going to be a really cool discussion. Now, Wednesday night, it's not listed here as a CES event because it's not CES. And, but Wednesday night on the mall at 8 p.m., we're going to have a candlelight vigil for anybody who's experienced the loss of a friend or a loved one through suicide. So I encourage you, uh, even if you haven't experienced that loss, it's going to be a wonderful show of solidarity. I teach on Wednesday nights, and I'm hoping to still be able to get out of class in time to be a part of that ceremony as well. On Thursday, we're going to have a panel discussion on Batman and capital punishment. Now, guys, what's capital punishment? Yes. Exactly. And so Batman, what is his one rule? What's Batman's one rule in fighting crime? No bad skull, what won't he do? He'll kill him. No kill. He won't kill someone. So Batman's one rule is he won't take a life. Well, a lot of people ask the question, would it be more ethical if Batman finally snapped and just snapped the Joker's neck, took him out of the loop? So we're going to be talking with a number of people whether or not that's a more ethical decision. And the panel's going to have somebody from criminal justice, somebody from religious studies, somebody from literature, and actually a pop culture instructor are all going to come in and debate the topic. You guys are invited to be part of that. That also gets you a CES credit. Now this is the big one. Next Friday, guys, and I'm offering up two bonus points for you to give up part of your Friday night with me. Michael Uslan. Mr. Usland, I should say Dr. Usland, is the guy who brought Batman to the big screen. He's the executive producer of every Batman film ever made. In 1989, he brought the first film to the big screen. It took 10 years to get there. This guy's responsible for over a trillion dollars in box office receipts. He is the godfather of the modern superhero blockbuster. If he hadn't made the 89th Batman film, we would not have the Avengers and Spider-Man on the big screen today. He is the guy who started all of this, and he's going to be here. If you can't tell, I'm a little excited about this. So he's going to be talking at 7 p.m. in JFK uh, Auditorium about what it took to get those movies made. And he's also going to tell you about how they promoted them. Keep in mind, 1989, what did people not have in their homes yet? You got it. It was pre-internet viral marketing. You couldn't go anywhere in 1989 without seeing the yellow Batman symbol. So this is a whole week of activities. We're also doing a superhero carnival for the kids of the area from 5 to 7. Some of you are even volunteering for that. I encourage you to be a part of it. If your sports team or organization would like to be a part of it too, we're kicking off that event at 5 o'clock on Friday with a superhero parade. It is going to be one heck of a fun week. So I hope that you all plan on joining us. Any questions about next week before we, we dive into material for today? Guys, I love this stuff. Uh, I think superheroes are fantastic, and they give us things to live up to in our lives. So, guys, uh, one other reminder. Actually, I've already eaten up 10 minutes of class time, but one other reminder. If you uh, have some free time in the middle of the day, there's also going to be some music and fun out on the mall today. It's a multicultural festival. We're going to be playing some drums and, and making some sounds at noon. I hope you'll stop out. We left off talking about productivity in our last class. Who here can tell me, if we're, if we're measuring productivity, I would have something to write on. Please put something on your desk, guys, to write on. So this can take notes for your laptop. Your laptop is fine. Guys, put it in your own words and tell me if somebody's very productive, what do we what do we mean about that? Somebody's very productive is very what? Yes. How quickly you can get like a certain amount of work done. Exactly right. Are we making good use of resources? Are we efficient? Are we getting our work done? In the United States, we're more and more productive all the time. Guys, I had a really interesting experience last night. My wife and I were on the way to a concert, and because I was too cheap to buy her a good meal, we stopped at Burger King. So I owe her a good meal, but I thought it was pretty amazing when I walked in there. The Burger King in Emmitsburg now has kiosks where you don't even have to go to the counter. You can just go and order yourself. Why does that contribute to productivity? Company productivity, not necessarily the person's productivity. Why does that contribute? Yes? If you consider productivity efficient, then there's one less person that needs to take your order and it takes less time to do so. That's exactly correct. And if you go to the companies like Wawa and Sheets, they still have a lot of people working there, but they're working in the back making sandwiches instead of taking orders. So the new services we're putting in place help make us more productive. Productivity also comes into the business cycles. Guys, in 2008, we just came out of a recession. And we're going to talk about how this stuff all works together. 
Recessions are not good. Nobody likes recessions. But they're not something that's apocalyptic. It's not the end of the world. In fact, it's part of the normal way things work. Guys, when we have a long-term business cycle, we start off with an economic boom. Who here can give me an example of a time when, in the United States or anywhere in the world, an economy experienced an economic boom? What would be an example of a time a company, or a country rather, experienced an economic boom? When things went gangbusters for a company, or a country rather. Yes? Uh, the yes. Yeah, that's a great one. You know, we started to mechanize. All of a sudden, we're producing stuff. One of the most recent ones. Guys, in the 1990s, i got to tell you, the 1990s were awesome. You guys seem to like the 90s here. Let's show of hands here. Who likes Friends? Some people still watch Friends. It's a big deal. Uh, Netflix just got a 90s sitcom they got the rights for for next year. Who am I talking about? Big 90s show. That would be a big one, too. That was a big show in that era. Uh, somebody said, Saved by the Bell. Uh, I'm talking about Seinfeld. Seinfeld's a big one for that era, too. Well, here's the other thing that happened in the 90s. It's called the dot-com boom. Man, was it a big deal. Think about this. Imagine your life today with new internet. I know, it's terrifying. I'm terrified to think about it myself. In 1995, that's when internet en masse started really coming into the homes of America. Other countries actually were, were ahead of us in terms of getting home internet, but it started really coming into, into play. And so everybody was jumping online. Amazon jumped online, for example. And we experienced an economic boom. Because all these people with money to invest are saying, wow, this is a great idea. We're going to throw some money at this idea, and hopefully we're going to make some money out of this idea. A couple of years of really big investment happened, and we get to right around 2000, and this big bubble that we were creating burst. And it was called the end of the dot-com era, the, the dot-com bust, the bubble bust. And what basically happened was everybody realized all this money we put in, we were not getting back out. So we had a bust that turned into a recession. By the way, an economic bust, remember this. I would write this down. Economic bust is not an official term. You may see a multiple choice question asking you about an economic bust. That's not an official term. The official term is recession. If you go two quarters of the year, so if you go six months and your GDP isn't getting bigger, it's shrinking, you're in a recession. We just came out of a recession a, uh, a few uh, years back, out of 2008. Some people even went as far as saying we were actually in a depression. Now, we associate the, the word depression with what era of American history? Yes. You got it. And what happened during that period? Uh, it was when all the stocks dropped and everyone took all their money out of banking. Yeah, people, bankers, literally in New York, were throwing themselves out of windows saying the sky is falling because the markets were crumbling. And we went into the Great Depression. By the way, guys, when we were in our last recession, the unemployment rate in the United States was right around 10 to 11 percent. Not good. Anybody know how high it got during the Great Depression? Yes. It's really close. That's a good guess, Ben. It's right around 25%. So think about that. Back in the 1920s into the 1930s, one in four people trying to get work that could not get a job. That's, that's hard stuff. If you want to know why things like organized crime and other kinds of unofficial businesses took root in the 1930s, that's one of the reasons. Well, after you go through a depression, hopefully, your country's going to come out and you're going to experience a recovery when things start normalizing. Let's use Amazon as an example. We all love Amazon, right? It, by show of hands, how many of you in the last 30 days of your life have bought something off Amazon? Yeah, it's amazing. I can't imagine my life without Amazon. So the economic boom was the 1990s. Amazon, by the way, anybody know what Amazon's core business was in the 1990s? What did they sell? Yeah, it was like the most fundamental thing, books. So Amazon experienced an economic boom in the 90s. And by the way, Amazon patented something and the patent only expired two years ago, and it was called one-click purchasing. Literally, if you created a website up until 2017, <coughs> and you allowed people to click one thing and make a purchase tied to their account like Amazon does, you had to pay a royalty to Amazon because they had patented it. That's how little people knew about the Internet in 1995 to 1997. Now, we're smarter now. That's not going to happen again, we hope. But the, the recession hits, the dot-com bust hits in 2000. 
and all of a sudden there's only a few survivors. Amazon is one of those survivors. Between the economic uh, boom and economic recession and then into the depression, in this area here, is Amazon turning a profit? Anybody have a guess? No. They didn't. Why, so why, why do investors still keep throwing money at Amazon? That's exactly right. They're saying, we know you're not making money now, but you can make money in the future. But the bottom line, all these companies that thought they had great ideas fell off because they weren't as strong. And finally, we hit the economic recovery. And last year, uh, Christmas time, 4.5 out of every $10 spent on the internet in 19, in, uh, yeah, 19, 2018, were going to Amazon, one company. So you may have heard the term double dip recession. These are really depressing times because here's what happens. If we think, okay, we fell in this hole, we're in a recession, use this as an analogy. Let's say, for example, you fell in a deep, muddy hole. And every time you start trying to claw your way out of it, you slip and you slide back down. You just see a daylight and you fall back down to the bottom. What happens at that point? Other than falling to the bottom, how do you feel? How do you feel if you slide back in the hole? Depressed. Man, I'm never getting out of this thing. So double dip recessions are really tough because we, we start getting out of a recession and we start seeing the light of day and we slide back in. So anytime you come out of recession and you slide back in, that's called a double dip and it's a very demoralizing thing because people start thinking the economy is turning around and it isn't. So let's say, for example, we're on our way out of that recession and we slide back in. You guys in this room are all market investors. Are you feeling optimistic or not? No, you're going to hang on to your assets. You're going to hang on to bonds. What's the difference, by the way? I know we haven't hit this yet. Does anybody know the difference between a stock and a bond? What's the difference? Uh, stock is an uh, equity in the company, and a bond is um, incurring a debt from somebody else. Exactly right. And if you had to say, now this is not a universal statement, and this obviously you'll learn the nuances of finance class as well. Generally speaking, what's a riskier investment, a stock or a bond? You got it. Because bonds have to be legally repaid. If all of a sudden you see everybody in the market is saying, we're getting out of the stock market and we're investing in bonds, it is not a positive sign for the economy. So keep in mind, if people are saying, if bond rates are going up, if the payouts for bonds are going up, uh, more people may be saying, we're going to jump out of the stock market as well. So guys, we also know that the government occasionally intervenes in our economy. One of the most recent times we saw this happen was in 2008. Now, guys, here's a question for you. We all believe that we have a free market economy. Number one, why does the government occasionally get involved in the economy? We have a free market. It's supposed to be self-regulated. So why would the government occasionally say, we got to step in? What do you think? This is a complex question. Why do you think the government would want to intervene? Well, I'll ask a related question. Go ahead. Yes. Exactly right. We have uh, we have short memories, we always like to say. In this country, we have short memories. When, when things go bad, we tend to forget them pretty quickly. Well, what happened was, in the stock market crash that led to the Great Depression, there was very little market control. So more market controls came into being. When we had the market crash of 2008, the government instituted more market controls, things that they, they call them stress tests for banks. Anybody here ever hear of a medical procedure called a stress test? You know, if you haven't heard of it, what a stress test is, if they're worried somebody has a bad heart, you give them a stress test to find out how much exercise they can do, how much walking they can do, how bad is their heart really? If somebody's got a bad heart, can't you know, climb four flights of stairs. They started doing more stress tests on banks to see if they would be able to withstand these kinds of pressures. And that happened right after 2008, so we wouldn't see another economic meltdown. Well, the current administration is starting to roll back some of those procedures as well. I don't say that as a political statement. You know, you can, you can make up your own mind on politics, but the bottom line is occasionally when we fix things or set up safeguards, we remove them as soon as the, the going is not, is not as rough as it used to be. So in terms of, of fiscal policy, we really have, have two things. Remember, we've got fiscal and we've got monetary. We think fiscal, we think finance. We think monetary, we think money. Yeah, so that's exactly what it's for. Fiscal policy means basically how are you, how are you raising money, how are you spending money. Now, guys, here's the trick. 
Uh, what's the primary way in which the U.S. government gets money to spend? You got it. It's taxes, man. Nobody likes hearing that taxes are going up, but most of us enjoy what we get from taxes. For example, what's something that we all get from taxes? We get roads. Absolutely. I mean, there are places in the world where you pay to use most roads. We don't. We pay your taxes. What else do we get because of taxes? Schools. If you go to public school, you, you get you get your schooling through taxes. What else do we get through taxes? Any other guesses? Yes. Law enforcement and politicians. You got it. You got law enforcement, politicians, the military, national defense, and a lot of social programs too. For example, I hope nobody in this room ever experiences getting laid off or losing their job. But if you do, you get unemployment pay because we pay taxes into it. And finally, at the end, you get Social Security if it's still around. But here's the trick, guys. The United States has been spending beyond its means for the most, of, most of the last 50 years. If you are spending beyond your means and borrowing money to do so, generically speaking, what are we living on? It's a C word. We're living on credit, man. And when you owe somebody money, you got to pay them interest. Right now... The U.S. government is operating uh, at a deficit. So basically, if, we, if you want to know what the deficit is, that's the amount that we spend past what we have in the bank. If you want to know why Congress always has to vote on raising the debt limit, what they're basically saying is, this is how much beyond what we bring in that we are willing to go into hawk for, that we're willing to have credit for. The national debt, if you take all the deficits one year after the next and add them up, that gets you national debt. Now, a national surplus very rarely happens in this country when we have money left over after we pay our bills. Guys, we owe money to everybody. Do you know who the number one holder of U.S. debt is? It is China. Absolutely. Now, there are ways also that we can, we can get our own citizens to offload some of our debt. We can sell something to our citizens. Your grandparents may have bought you one of these over time. What can we, what can we give our government in exchange, how can we get some of the debt off the government and onto the population? Yes, yeah, savings bonds. So basically, what you're giving is a loan to your own government, and under the promise you'll be paid interest over a long period of time. The longer you hold them, generally the worth they're more more they're worth till they mature. So again, guys, we have a big national debt. Check this out, guys. Our national debt right now is 20 trillion. It's over 20 trillion. What's our GDP? It's about 19. So right now we owe more than our actual economy is worth. Guys, there's actually something called the, the National Debt Clock. I'm going to bring it up for you. You can look it up on Google. I, I encourage you to do so. If you want to, you can actually sit here and watch the debt accrue. Here you can watch it come in. So there's the national debt going up right before your eyes. Now, right now, for example, according to the, the current math today, we, we're at uh, 22 trillion. And we can compare that to all these other statistics that tell us how our economy is doing. I encourage you to look at it on your own time. It might make you ill when you think about it. Now, guys, here's the other trick. When I say this, I'm a fan of low taxes. I love the idea of reducing corporate tax rates. I love the idea of reducing income taxes. But it doesn't add up if you don't cut spending. So a year and a half ago, we cut business tax rates in this country. We, we cut individual tax rates. What's been happening to the national debt and the deficit since then? It's been going up. So to me, it's one of these things that you save if you want to take a conservative fiscal policy, you cannot quit taking in revenue without curbing your spending. And that's not happening so far. And here's the thing. That's also, by the way, not a Republican or a Democrat issue. If you look at the history of every president in the last 50 years, Almost all of them have increased the, the debt and the deficit some way. It is not a Republican or Democrat issue. It's a spending problem. Yes? Shouldn't it be like unconstitutional to go past the budget, past the uh, budget for that year? Otherwise, it's... I, I, would, I would encourage you to ask your congressman that question because they, they're always voting to raise the debt ceiling. Yeah. And they're not changing the Constitution, but it's basically an act of Congress to basically say... We're going to go against our own rules to keep the government operating. So, uh, does this, this bother anybody beside me? Yeah, it's sooner or later. Here's the trick. Let's see. John, John's a good guy. He lent me some money here, for example. John, you lent me 50 bucks last week because I, I couldn't pay my rent. That was really awesome of you to do. 
I haven't paid John back yet. So two weeks later, I come back and say, hey, John, I know I didn't pay that 50 bucks. Can I borrow another 50 bucks? I'm short on that. What are you going to say to me? Me? Who can blame them? Why would you lend somebody more money if they can't pay, pay you what they already owe? And sooner or later, he's going to get kicked off at me enough to come after, after me to get his money back because it's his money. Sooner or later, if you're borrowing money from people, they're going to wonder why are you allowing these folks to continue to, to borrow from you. Let me give you an example. I don't mean to say this as an alarmist. I want you to think about it. China keeps lending us money. Why? Well, it's, it, it's, a, it's a symbiotic ecosystem because they're one of our biggest trading partners in the world. If they quit lending us money, we probably wouldn't do as much business with them either. And that's why the, the saber rattling that's going on between the U.S. and China is something we should keep our eyes on. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do it or we should do it. I'm saying it's going to affect the way we interact. Make sense, guys? Questions or comments? This is a big issue. I feel guilty that, for example, my generation is leaving such a, a financial mess for the generation that's coming after us. What, you, what questions would you like to ask? Questions or comments this morning? Ma'am. Yeah. When you borrow from other countries, that are countries, uh, do parents have interest? It's, most of these transactions, or a lot of them, are actually uh, handled through the World Bank. And so we actually have an international organization. It's currently based in Washington, D.C., but it's called the World Bank, and it's just like a normal bank. So you're actually borrowing money off of other countries, and yeah, they're charging interest. And I mean, think about this. If you're a bank or if you're a credit card company, that's your business model. You basically lend money and charge interest to get it back. The last time we had a balanced budget in terms of, of not accruing new debt was was in the 1990s. It's been a long time. So technically, <laughs> if we would want to pay back the money that we borrowed, we would be putting back the interest too? You got it. Or, or you'd negotiate a settlement. You know, have you ever seen those commercials like for the uh, for the, the debt relief firms and things like Harold Shepley and Associates, how they can negotiate with creditors? You, you could work on an arrangement like that, too. Here's, a, here's an idea, too. Even though we owe China money and we owe Japan money and we owe the U.K. money, uh, other countries owe us money, too. So in some ways, bless you. It's kind of like a shell game. Bless you. Uh, for example, Guinea, Africa actually owes us money. Uh, a few other developing countries owe us money, and it's very it's a very noble thing for developed countries, for example, to forgive that debt. A country like China will likely not forgive that debt with us. So, I don't mean to say it as a downer, guys. I mean to say it as, as something we should be aware of. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, th I think if, if, if I were being honest, I don't know what that amount is, but they also probably... Uh, uh, Owe us in some morale too because of the, the support that we gave them. I, I don't say that as a smart out statement, but it's one of those things. I think based on the bond between these two countries, I don't think the time anytime soon is going to come where they're going to they're going to basically uh, we're, we're going to come after them as a collection agent. <laughs> so yeah, they, they do owe us money. A lot of countries owed us money from World War II. And here's the other thing that's really interesting. This is my last statement uh, before we go back into the lecture, guys. In World War II, we were the only country that for the most part, of all the countries involved in that conflict that had no major land damage beyond well, Pearl Harbor, I don't mean to say that was, was not major, but our industrial infrastructure was completely intact, essentially. So when we came out of the war, that's the reason we became an economic powerhouse, because we had all the capability. There, there was something called the Deming Plan. Has anybody ever heard of that? Here's the trick, guys. Uh, the United States, we had business and management philosophies and ways of producing and making well well run efficient factories. Nobody in this country wanted to deal with them. So we took them to Japan and showed them how to be efficient, and Japan kicked our butts from the 1970s through the 1990s with our own strategies because they were willing to listen. Here's an example. Uh, in Japan, if you, you have people who are working on an assembly line making a car, and let's say, for example, the car's coming down the line, and one of the earlier people in the line remembered, wow, I think I missed a bolt back there. If that car cannot go off the line, that person had the authority to pull a lever and say, stop the line, we got to check this car. Now compare that to some of our manufacturing practices in the United States, where everybody last, last month who just bought a $65,000 Jeep Wrangler or a Jeep Wrangler pickup is getting to take it back for recall because nobody put lubricant in the rear seals. Compare those two philosophies. So we absolutely took a lot of our good ideas and gave them away. So we talked about fiscal policy. Now we're talking about monetary policy. I'm talking about money. How much money am I putting in circulation? What is my money worth? Guys, check this out. 
Why is our money? I, it's funny because I, I never have money. I think I've got a total of one dollar. I, I literally have one dollar in my wallet right now. Why is this worth a dollar? Because the the Fed says it is. They're backing it up. Here's the trick, guys. In the old days, we used to literally back our currency with what? You got it. We got out of the gold standard in Richard Nixon's administration in the early 1970s. So right now, monetary policy is, is controlling how much money should be in circulation. In the recession of 2008, there literally was a movement to print more money and put more in circulation so that there was more cash moving through the economy. Generally speaking, this also uh, affects lending, too. When you borrow money, you pay an interest rate. The Fed sets minimum interest rates for, for most practices. So when the Fed set an interest rate, the economy's doing well, they raise interest rates a little bit because why should the banks and the finance groups benefit if people are more excited about borrowing money? When we're in a recession, they, they cut the interest rates down, they reduce the interest rate to try to spur on lending. When we think about things like borrowing money, what do we usually think about? Like what would cause you to borrow money? Yes. Mortgages, that's a big one. As Michelle was saying the other night, most Americans, our largest source of wealth is our home. What else do we borrow money for? The home is a big one, I'm sorry? Car payments, yes, car payments for sure. What else? Yes? Uh, business. Business. Tell me more about that one. That's where I was going. Um, well, actually, uh, I think it's called leveraging, but uh, people will uh, take out loans start a business per se uh, in capital and I think even if someone had enough of their own money to start a business they would still take out the loan because if the, if the interest rates are low you won't need to pay tax make it uh, your own money or something like that but I, I, I think that's just one reason why people take out loans to start a business. I'm glad you brought up business though because here's the trick. A lot of companies for example operate on tight margins. A lot of the companies we shop with actually borrow money on a monthly basis to make payroll. They stay one month ahead of the creditors. And here's the trick with that whole scenario, guys. When 2008 hit and all of a sudden nobody was lending money, a lot of companies went under because they couldn't make payroll. That's how close the margins are on some of this stuff, guys. What's a big company right now in the United States just mentioned they're going to be closing hundreds of locations? Something that's tied into something you all enjoy very much, or at least some of you enjoy very much, involving buttons, controllers, video games. GameStop is going to be closing hundreds of locations because they, they cannot keep up on the, the margins they're operating anymore. And that is a monetary policy issue. Well, check that out, guys. We made it through. And so what we're going to do, before, before we do our review here, a reminder. I'm going to be extending the due dates on the environments of business. Uh, and you know what we're going to do, guys? We're going to do the uh, five environments of business together as a group. Or not the five environments, the economic systems ex exercise. We're going to do the economic systems exercise together as a group on Monday. And the assignment will be due on Wednesday. That way you'll see what I'm asking for. If you've already submitted it, you're welcome to redo it if you feel that you, what you did was an error. But we're going to cover that first thing Monday as part of our class. On Monday, we're also going to have a couple of guest speakers coming in from Career Services to talk about some of the services they offer. So your next assignments are not due Monday, they're due on Wednesday. And you know about all the extra credit opportunities? Any questions before we go into our review? Okay, guys, let's check it out. The study of how society employs various resources to produce goods and services for consumption among various groups and individuals with a concentration on the operation of the nation's economy as a whole is that economics, macroeconomics, microeconomics, or Reaganomics. Say it real loud. We have guests for C. It's actually B. Micro means small, macro means big. So if you had answered it as just economics, I probably would have given you credit for that answer as well. What did Thomas Malthus call economics? Was it the lonesome science, the bothersome science, the dismal science, or the pessimist science? Say it, say it real loud, guys. Z, there we go. Guys, I was telling some of the folks who came in early, I went to a concert last night. My earring is a little blown this morning, so make it count. When self-directed gain leads to social and economic benefits for the whole community, 
In other words, when we don't put barriers up to business and everybody benefits, do we call that the invisible hand, socialism, microeconomics, or the invisible touch? It is. Sounds like a horror movie. The invisible hand is out to get you. All or most of the land, factories, and stores are owned by individuals, not the government, and made for profit. What economic system am I talking about? It is capitalism. True or false? China is an example of a country with state capitalism. It, it, that is absolutely correct. All right, which of the following is not one of capitalism's four basic rights? The right to own property, the right to free speech, the right to freedom of competition, the right to freedom of choice. B. It's a, it's a right, but it's not part of the rights of, of, of capitalism. All right, moving on. True or false, in a free market, a country's government determines how much of a product should be produced. That is false. Who does? Consumers and the, the producers. All right. What determines the price of items in a free market? Is it cost of materials, competition, supply and demand, or the government? It is supply and demand. When, when su supply and demand have crossed over, we have what? B. B is correct. It is the market price. It's what the market will bear. True or false, there's no such thing as perfect competition. True, true. That is true. There. Hey, will somebody tell me one thing? Tell me something in life that is perfect. Oh, mom is definitely perfect. That's a great answer. Who else? What else is perfect? You say ice cream? Or what flavor? Man, I would love some ice cream right now. Cookies and cream. That's my favorite. Cookies and cream. Ice cream is perfect. What else is perfect, guys? One other thing that's perfect in this world. Help me out. Oh, I know that you guys believe. Love. Love perfect. Isn't love a perfect thing? It's not easy, but it's perfect. It is. Seriously. You, when you find the person who will who still love you when you're at your absolute worst, that's when you discover the meaning of life. I'll tell you guys sometimes some stories about my wife and I, and she puts up with a lot. All right. We got a large number of sellers making similar products. The consumer sees different. Do we have perfect competition, oligopy, monopolistic competition, or a monopoly? Take a guess. So we got a guess for B. It's a large number of products, not a small number. What's, what's, a, what's an answer you would pick if you didn't know at all? It's C. It's monopolistic competition. Because there's not much difference between a Whopper Jr. and a McDonald's hamburger. They're just packaged differently. Which economic system is most likely to give you the largest amount of government services? <coughs> Say it real loud. <coughs> These correct. True or false, there are many incentives for workers and entrepreneurs to excel in a socialist economy. False, absolutely. That's why they leave for capitalist economies. When the best and brightest leave a socialist economy, do we call it economic fatigue, brain drain, loss of intellectual capital, or economic collapse? It is brain drain. It's what we're all feeling because it's Friday. True or false? This, guys, this one I, I should have brought up to you and I didn't. I meant to talk about it. We'll see if you get it right anyway. I'm covering it now. Is this true or false? The U.S. spends more money on health care than any other country in the world. That is true. By the way, guys, out of our whole GDP, do you know how much money we spend on health care out, out of every $100 that go through our economy? How many of those dollars go in health care? Any guess? How much? That's real close. It's about 20. So one-fifth of our GDP is based on health care, guys. We are a sick country. An economic and political system which the government makes almost all economic decisions. Of course, I'm talking about, I'm talking about communism. All right, in blank economies, the government largely determines what goods and services are produced, who gets them, and how the economy will grow. That is a command economy. You're going to do what I say. The total value of goods and services produced in a country in a given year, what do we call it? Is it gross domestic product, economic well-being, a lot, or gross diuretic product? It is A, GDP me ASAP. That's what I'm talking about. True or false, U.S. GDP is about $5 trillion. What is it? You got it. If you said 19 to 20, I would accept that answer. When a person leaves a job voluntarily, what kind of unemployment is that? It is frictional because I'm out of here. I can't stand this place. I'm leaving. 
I have personal friction. True or false? The unemployment rate is an accurate measure of how many people are really unemployed. That is false, because what else do we have going in there? The labor force participation. The general rise in, in the prices of goods and services over time. What is that? It is inflation. Hmm. CPI is that confidence price increase, consumer price index, California prune index, or consumer production index? It is B. Correct, Mundo. The four phases, oh, this is the tricky one. The four phases of long term business cycles include all but the following is it economic boom, recession, depression, or economic bust? Economic bust is not a real, real economic term. A recession, or climbing out of the hole, followed by short lived recovery. Followed by another recession. What do we call that? Double dip cones are awesome. Double dip recessions are not. What is the name of the East German state manufactured car? Truvada. It's a Truvada. And just for you guys, there's the two-door SUV model. Isn't it beautiful? Guys, have a wonderful weekend. I'll see you Monday. Hey, have, by show of hands, who here's going to the game on, uh, on Saturday? I, I hope to see some of you there. Have a nice family weekend.